Okay, um, I was impressed with today's Thursday. You know, we've, um, we've used a little different format here the second half of the season in our Thursday practices. Um, and we're, we're challenging the guys to be really mentally sharp. And we're, we're getting a lot of plays, um, but we're not doing it at quite the tempo that we normally practice at, just so that we get make sure our legs are back and fresh on Saturday. And uh, last week was the first week we did it. And we came back this Thursday and we're much improved. I uh, was really impressed. Uh, I think all in all, the guys are in a, in a really good frame of mind. Um, I know they're excited for the opportunity to get back out in front of our, our home fans at the Coliseum and put on, and put on a great show. So Colorado wide receiver Nelson Spruce is among the nation's leader sure at many is. categories. What do you think makes him so unique from other collegiate wide receivers? Well, he's a really versatile guy, they, and they do a heck of a job moving him around. You know, they're putting him all over the field, and he's not just at one spot. And this coaching staff did this a year ago, the last couple of years, with Paul Richardson. And now Nelson has just kind of assumed that role of being their go-to guy. Uh, and, and you need to know where he is on every snap. And, but again, they, to their coach's credit, they do a good job of moving around. Uh, he runs a variety of routes. He's not a one-dimensional player. Um, and then he makes his plays. He's playing with a lot of confidence right now. Are any of the guys who've been banged up this week not going to be able to play uh, for sure on Saturday? I, I would say Soam was the most doubtful uh, of all of them. Um, and a Jane A, I don't think, is going to make it back either. Um, the rest of the guys, um, I would imagine, will play. Again, we have to monitor him as the game goes, um, you know. But but I would imagine all, the rest of those guys will go. What um, Steve uh, was went into the decision to go with like a, a new helmet and. I don't know. You know, I, I think for us, you know, for these guys, I mean, it was a way to to kind of update our look in a sense, but yet hold on to our tradition. And you know, I think you look around the country, and there's so many alternate uniforms and different things going on that, that this is a way to, to you know freshen things up a little bit um, but also again respect the respect our past do you like them yeah I think they're really cool I'll see how they look Saturday I'm gonna like them a lot more if we win <laughs> are you this is such a kind of tradition rich school and fan base sure. are you concerned at all that some people uh, won't I, like it I, I mean I I had to deal with this the last five years some too you're not gonna please everybody and for as many people as there are that that want us not to change a thing and to still wear the same cleats and whatever else are there's as many people that want something new too and they see what's going on in our conference and um, with our two of our biggest rivals are, are doing it you know and so um, I think it plays a part uh, you know but again we're trying to be respectful of, of our past and our tradition and, and all that, but also give us a, a little bit of freshness. And, and I know it's, you know, the guys are excited about it. So, and I think they look really good. I think they look classy. In some of the uh, mock drafts that are out right now or rankings of college prospects, Leonard is number one overall right. in those lists. Is that something that you embrace or that he should embrace? Do you just ignore it? Well, how do you feel about that? Well, I, how I feel about it is it's so far away. Um, the NFL now, you know, the, the the mock draft is like the playoff projections. It, it's so far away that I, I don't know, you know, it gives them TV time and they need content because there's so many shows on TV right now and they need to fill those time slots. But by the time they get done analyzing and overanalyzing every one of these players till, you know, in April or I don't even, the draft got pushed back this year. I don't, I don't know whatever the date was. Those things change so much. Um, for Leonard, uh, my more than anything is I just don't want it to affect his play that he holds back in any way or he's trying to save himself which he hasn't done I, I don't want to apply that at all he has not done that but that's always one of the concerns as a coach um, you know we, we heard about that a year ago with Jadavion Clowney that you know was he was he saving himself or not and so uh, we're fortunate Leonard's a great kid he loves football he loves competing um, he has not been a hundred percent healthy this season as we all know and he continues to play at a high high level um, we're the ones that hold him out of practice. If we're up to him, he would go. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure he's fresh and, and healthy for, for Saturdays. But those things, they change weekly, you know, and which they need to because they need content and they need people to watch it. So we just have to understand why they do what they do. Is that something you would have you or would, will you address that with him in terms of not letting it 
affect his play? Of or? course, yeah, we have, of course. And and I and I think too, you know, a lot of this stuff is we're halfway through the season now. All of our juniors, I have to start to address this stuff with them. As as we learned a year ago, uh, you know, I wish I had a better relationship with those kids uh, that left early because I think maybe a couple of them or a few of them maybe would have made a little better decision or at least had some more information. Um, but it was the situation that it was. Uh, hopefully this time around. Um, our guys are really well informed and make really educated decisions, not emotional ones, uh, that are in their best interest. And we're going to have a handful of guys that we're going to need to talk to, and obviously Leonard is one of them. I don't know if you saw it, but um, Mike Pereira, who was the official that they picked to set up the new officiating system and brought Tony Karenny in, wrote last week that one of the reasons uh, that he thought Karenny left was that the constant complaining by schools in the Pac-12 led by the two biggest complainers by far, Oregon and Stanford. My question is, how come USC is not on that list? <laughs> well, I just got here. <laughs> um, you know, I try to be respectful of, of the job that they have to do. And, and I don't, I, again, I don't expect officials to be perfect. They're human, and we're going to make human errors. Um, but I, I do like rationale. I do like, you know, reasoning of why different things occur uh, and we probably submit between five to eight plays a, a, on every given Saturday of, of a ruling on something sometimes it's not even from our game sometimes it's on Sunday you start coming in and looking at the film of your previous opponent and you send in stuff from their games as well that you just want information on and uh, if you have the information then you're okay with it you know but do I like human error by the officials no but we have to recognize that at times that's that's going to occur. Now they told us that they can't comment to us about any of their private conversations with you guys. So I thought it was interesting. Last week the SEC had the Arkansas-Alabama game where they screwed it up at the end. And by Monday the SEC came out and said the officials screwed it up. They cheated you know, Arkansas of a couple of plays. But with the Pac-12, if you watch that game Saturday, you have no idea what was decided about any of those number of controversial plays. Right. I, what would, I, mean, I think what again, we do? Well, I, again, I, I think that's probably a, a better question for for Larry and, and his team um, of how they want to conduct our conference. You know, we're members of the conference. Uh, we abide by the rules that are provided to us. I think that they've done a lot of good things to make our conference relevant and strong, stronger than it's ever been up into this since I've been involved in it. It's a great deal of parity. I think Larry and those guys will be the first ones to tell you we're not perfect yet and we're still working on things and maybe that is something that can be a topic of discussion for them. The, um, the, the position group that we as media people and fans seem to know the least about is the offensive line, whether they're doing well. Who, who's been the highest graded right. offensive lineman so far? Oh, I think Max Turk is playing really good football for us at center. Uh, we're lucky to have him. Um, he's, he's been a real mainstay for us. Um, I think. You know, the left side of our line has been very impressive with Toa and Chad. Um, I think the guy that's probably improved the most since week one to now is Vianney. Uh, I think Vianney's really come on strong. Um, you know, and I think and I think Zach Banner is, has been pretty steady, you know. Um, obviously, we've seen Andre Walker more and more and more since the beginning of the season. Damian Mama's had to fight through a few different injury things that maybe have held him back some. Um, but all in all, I think the unit as a whole might be the group that has steadily improved the most since week one, now heading into to, to game number seven. Uh, I think that their just overall improvement of their play, their run, run blocking, pass protection, communication, uh, understanding of our schemes, you know, all of those things, I think they've really made the most strides along the way. What have you learned about them in terms of what you can and what you can't do with them. How much does that help you well, call a game? Well, I think yeah. what we've learned as we've come along, uh, when Viani and Toa are in there at guards, we have two very athletic guards. And although they're young, they are athletic, they, they have a high football IQ, and they can really pull. So we've been pulling our guards more as the season has gone on. Um, on a variety of plays, but we've allowed those guys to get out and run and to move. And then the other thing I think I've learned is the athleticism of Max Turk. We've been pulling Max more than we did early in the year. Uh, and, and I think that that's helped Buck. I think that that, that fits his running style a little bit more too. Go ahead, Lindsay. I know you said um, 
as far as penalties go, like you kind of look at how consistent they are between the two teams. But this right. last week, you guys had a lot more. Are you concerned yeah. about kind of yeah. the discipline well, that, out there? Well, that one, that probably whenever I do have a gripe and if I'm ever frustrated, that's where my frustration comes in. And I wasn't happy at the end of the last game. You know, I was happy that we won, but when we have 13 penalties and they have four, that's a pretty major discrepancy. And so. Obviously, we submit our, our plays of, of question and, and the officials respond, you know, but that's if, if the if the conference ever really gets a true gripe for me, that's when that's when it's great because we all we all coach. We're all teaching. We're, we're all, you know, our guys are working hard, just like every other school's working hard about, and, you, know, you know, how to how to play the game the right way. And, you know, when when you come out of a game with two really good teams with that discrepancy, um, I have a little bit of a problem with that, but you know, some games, I guess that's that's how it gets called. Were you surprised that the same crew showed up for that game as the Stanford crew that no, they came back and no, gave I'm, you those I'm, guys again? I was okay with them, and I apologized to every one of those guys. I, the way I handled myself and conducted myself was not right, uh, and I apologized to every one of them, and we moved on. Okay.